Hey, how's it going? My name's Mayron, as always, and today I'm going to be showing you how to create and add widgets onto our graphical frame we created in the last episode, which we called the parent frame. Then we can add scripts to each one of these widgets and make them interactive with the user, and also other improvements such as being able to move the frame around on screen and adding a scroll bar. We don't really know yet what our add-on options will require for our add-on that we uh, talked about in the last episode. But just for demonstration purposes, we will add to our frame a font string to display a title, three buttons called Save, Reset and Load, and then two sliders to control the width and the height of buff status bars that we will create. For this add-on, this buff add-on, I think it would be nice to have three different modes for it. So for the first one, you maybe want to be able to show buff icons like you usually would see with the Blizzard buff frames. And then another one maybe to show status bars instead to represent a buff timer, and another one which can include a mix of the two to create some sort of timer with an icon next to it. So the buttons can be used like a generic profile system, without the need for external libraries like we touched on about in episode 1 when we talked about the ACE library. You will be able to load, save and reset data that we store, and we're going to store them inside a saved variable at some point in the future when we start talking more about saved variables, and how to actually set them up correctly. That is just a brief overview of what we'll be aiming for for our add-on project, but for now let's just continue where we left off by opening up that core.lua file that we put inside of that new add-ons folder we created, and then we're going to start adding these child frames and layered regions to our main frame that we named UI config, unless of course you named it something else. You can create all of these things in XML if you wanted to, and we'll cover this in future, but instead we will do this all in Lura because it's actually a lot more simpler way of doing it, and it has some good advantages to do it this way. And it is highly recommended to keep the Lua script so you can actually add into XML files down to a minimum. Usually, when adding scripts in XML, you assign scripts to a global function name and actually filling the body of code for these global functions in Lua files, which causes you to have to separate the actual XML related code, the, you know, the frame setting up code with the scripts, which can be pretty messy. So keeping all code in a Lua file is often much more preferred, and it saves the need for creating global variable names for these functions, which is always a big plus. The main reason you often want to create and set up frames in XML, rather than in Lua, is when you want to create a frame which can be reused again and again by turning it into an XML template, using the attribute name called virtual. Any frame in XML is not a template frame unless this virtual attribute is set to true. If you actually look in the UI panel templates.xml file as shown in the last episode, you will probably have noticed that they all have this attribute called virtual. This is the main reason to use XML. If a frame is not declared virtual, you cannot use it for that fourth argument, that comma separated string list for the create frame global function. This list is only supposed to be used with virtual frames, also known as XML templates. Because this UI config frame and all of its child frames are only supposed to be used once in our add-on, there is no need to create them and turn them into XML templates using this virtual attribute. But, as I have said before, you can still do this, but we won't be doing that for this project, because it's not really needed and it's a bit less of a convenience to actually do so. So let's now create a title for our UI config parent frame. Because all frames are actually tables, you can actually assign new key and value pairs to tables simply by using a dot after the table followed by the key, which can be a variable styled name or a string surrounded by two square brackets. You can actually attach any object of any kind and values to the parent frame directly with, rather than creating a new local variable for each child frame reference. By doing this method instead, you are keeping all the related data together in one table, which is a massive advantage. For example, you can pass to a function a frame as the argument and have full access to all of its child frames that you put inside of this table, and any values that you also attach to this table, like we have done on the screen as you can see just here. If you used a local variable instead, like this, then you cannot gain access to values related to a parent frame unless they're child frames or regions and you have to use the getChild or getRegionsFrame function in order to identify them. 
but that is much more of a hassle when it comes with its own supply of problems. You will notice that my code has a lot less local variables because I utilize this approach. So let's start talking about font strings. Font strings must be given a font before you can actually add text using the set text font string function. Otherwise you'll get a Lura error because you cannot add text without telling the Lura interpreter which font you want to use to render this text and there are three ways of doing this. The first two ways involve assigning an XML template font object which causes your font string to inherit font properties. This can include things like the font color, the size, shadow effects, outline styles and a few other things which are less significant. So in order to attach this font object onto your font string, there are two ways, either as a third argument of the create font string function, or by using the set font object function itself. Remember that these XML templates are created in XML, so they cannot be accessed directly by Lua using the global function system that Lua offers. This is because these are two separate programming environments, so you have to add these template names as strings. This is the only way of linking the two environments together. The third way of assigning a font is to use the set font function. This takes up to three arguments, which include the file name path, which is a string, the font height, which sort of works the same way you'd see in any word processing program like Microsoft Word or HTML on the internet. So, you know, size 12 is usually pretty good. Size 11, you know, same sort of numbers. And the third argument is optional, which is referred to as font flags. This is a comma separated string list of flag types. These types include the keywords monochrome, all in caps, outline, and thick outline. I think these all need to be in uppercase. And by using a comma separated list, you can combine these three styles together, but outline and thick outline, which I've never tried to combine, but it seems kind of pointless because I would have thought that thick outline sort of overrides the outline style by, you know, just being larger, so it will cover up the outline effect. The set font function also returns a value. It returns one if the font file was successfully found, given the path that you gave it, otherwise it would return nil to let you know that it failed to find it, which is a nice way of testing if the font URL path that you supplied it was a valid one or not. The last thing to talk about regarding our code is that the setPoint function uses the UI config.titleBG as the relative frame to relatively position it to. This is incredibly important to note for two strong reasons. The first is that this titleBG is not actually a frame. It is in fact a texture, which is a layered region. This can seem confusing as the second set point argument is called the relative frame. So you would think that it needs to be a frame, but it doesn't. This means that you can actually position widgets relative to layered regions and not just frames. The next major point is that we have never created this title BG region, as it was actually inherited from the XML template we chose to use for the UI config parent frame. However, things get a bit more trickier than it seems. If we look at the XML template code that we chose our parent frame to inherit from, you won't actually find the title BG region there either. This is because this XML template actually inherits another template itself. So this tells us that you can actually have a very long chain of inheritance, which is a sort of way of achieving multiple inheritance. You will see this attribute called inherits, which targets the basic frame template, which thankfully is right on top of the code for the templates that we have chosen to inherit from. So this saves us having to search for it, which is quite nice. In this list of layers, you will see the title BG here. So we know that we have inherited it into our UI config frame inside of our Lua file without us even noticing. This title BG region is the texture that appears on the very top of our graphical frame. So it's actually a separate texture. So assigning our title text relative to this makes a lot of sense. So we don't have to position it with some crazy X and Y coordinates to get it exactly where we want because it's in a relative place for where we actually want it to appear. So thankfully, that sort of ends the really informational heavy parts of this episode. Next, we will create three buttons mentioned earlier and the code for each one of these looks incredibly similar. So we can skip ahead a bit and I'll add this code onto the screen. 
So all of these button functions look very similar. You can use the button function set text to directly alter the button's main text, which saves a lot of time if you having to locate the font string attached to the button itself. Because buttons generally just have one major text that shows on the button, you can add more if you want to, but Blizzard knows that buttons will usually want to have just one major text, like, you know, a cancel text or an OK button, which has the OK text. So they've made this set text function, which saves a lot of time. A button has functions for controlling the font object used during button events. For example, you have the set normal font object, which is just the normal appearance of text on a button, whereas the set highlight font object function controls the font object you want to have it changed to when your mouse moves over the button. There is another called set pushed font object, which assigns the font object you want to be used for, you know, the major text to change to when you have your mouse button pressed and holding down onto the button itself. But this is not mandatory because if you do not include it, it just means that the font object will not change during this button event and will continue to use the one which it was already set to. Most user interface option styled widgets like buttons, checkboxes, or I should say check buttons, sliders, and other ones for example, have the ability to be disabled, so you can actually set the disabled font object as well. Sadly though, this does not also apply to textures. If you want to alter the textures for when a widget is disabled, like you probably would have noticed the Blizzard UI does itself. For example, if a button on the Blizzard UI is disabled, it usually turns its textures to gray. Then instead you would have to add a script handler for the script called on disable. There is also an on enable script, as you could uh, probably imagine, which is a reverse of this. So when a button is set to enabled, this script is activated and all script handlers that are attached to this script will then be triggered. And then whatever you've added to the script handler, this will be triggered so then the texture will change for the texture you want it to be changed to for this type of script. We haven't covered scripts yet, but we will most likely do in the next episode. Our buttons all inherit the game menu button template, which is found in the UI panel templates.xml file as we have seen in the last episode. However, by examining this, you will notice that it itself inherits from another XML template called UI panel button template. This template is not as simple to find, unfortunately, as it is not included in the UI panel templates file, despite having a very similar name. So you would actually think it would be in this file, but unfortunately, as templates become more and more abstract, they tend to be stored in other more general files somewhere else. In this case, you will find that the UI panel button template is actually inside of the interface shared XML folder in the shared UI panel templates XML file. So once you get inside of that, if you scroll down, you'll find this and you will also find that this controls the graying out texture behavior as we explained earlier for when the button is disabled. This gives you a nice sneak peek of how XML controls scripts. And it can be argued that this markup style approach is much more simple as long as you remember that you need to set the notepad++ language to Lura because this Lura script is inside of an XML file so you won't get all of that nice highlighting for keywords like you would do in a .lura file. So let's go back now and add some sliders. Again, for both of these sliders, they use very similar code so we can jump ahead. There are three new functions that come with slider objects. This includes the set value step function, meaning that each time the user slightly moves the slider across to the next step, this is changing the value by a number that you give it. The set min and set max value functions give the slider its scale. If you set the step value to 30, for example, then the slider won't slide as smoothly as there are only three possible options that the slider can slide to, or in this case, you can call it jumping to instead because that's the sort of effect that it's giving. However, there's one major important thing to note about this, which throws a lot of add-on authors off. The set value step function for sliders does not actually work as you would expect. Well, technically it doesn't work at all, unless you use the set obey step on drag function. God damn, I wish these function names were a lot easier to say because when making a video about this, it's actually quite a mouthful to actually have to say. 
So if you set the obey step on drag function the value true, this will make the set value step function behave correctly. This function has no documentation, however, on WoW programming, but it's sort of obvious what it does, even though the reason for this actually existing in the first place is a little less obvious. It seems as though its only purpose in the API is to solve this slider problem, but a better way to solve this problem would be to actually make the setValueStep function actually behave correctly in the first place. Because by default, if you don't use this setObjectStepOnDrag function to true, then the step value will always be incredibly small. By default, every single step would be as low as possible, so it's going to appear as a very long floating point number for very high precision, which is not always what you want. Sliders can also be set vertically using setOrientation function, but the slider we have inherited from gives us a texture that was intended to be used for horizontal sliders, so we won't be using this. Vertical sliders are usually used mainly for scroll bars, for scroll frames, which again we will cover in the future. The last thing I want to quickly introduce is the use of the check buttons, as shown in the video. The only new function for this is called set checked, which is similar to how the sliders set value option works, as it alters the state that the widget is in. However, unlike sliders, check buttons can only have two states, either checked or not checked which is represented by passing it a boolean value which is either true or false, or nil which is also the same as saying false. I think before, in the past, you could actually supply it with 1 or 0 which represents true or false, but I'm pretty sure that a patch came out and I remember reading some documentation somewhere saying that they've removed this, so you have to give it a boolean value. We have also given these check buttons that we've created on the screen the very common check button template, and now, if we reload the UI again by typing forward slash RL, you will see the graphical frame that we created updated with all of these child frames, with the odd exception of that font string, that layered, which is a layered region. This looks much nicer. But, as you add more and more widgets to such a small parent frame container, they're going to overflow. To control this, you have to add a scroll frame with a scroll bar, which we definitely should cover soon, but I think to the actual script handlers are probably the next thing we're going to start talking about. But for now, I'm going to leave you with a list of other game font types, because I only introduced to you the basic game font highlight, and there are more which add different stylized fonts by inheriting different properties for your fonts, without having to personally set them up yourself. But of course, like all of these XML templates, you can create your own so that you can get the perfect look and style that you're after. Anyway guys, I hope that this has been fairly easy to follow, but if not, send me your questions and I will try to answer them either in the comment section or in a Q&A video, or maybe just in future episodes. So again, this has been Mayron, and until next time, bye for now.